would like us to welcome uh, the presidents once again, and Gabriel Elbroni, the president of the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society, alongside with Ben Page, the CEO of Ipsos, for the presentation of the Women's Forum Barometer 2023. Let's give them a round of applause. Hi. 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 Bonjour again. Good morning again. So together with Ben Page, we will present the first edition of the Women's Forum Barometer on Gender Equity. We had decided to create this barometer back in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, to measure the perception of gender equality and compare it to real data. Just for you to know, we are the only platform to do this type of exercise. And I encourage you to read the report that was just released today. We are going to summarize the main points with Ben, but there is a lot more that you can find in the report. So let's dive into the results. Okay. Ben will start. Thank you very much, Anne. So the first point, just for people who are into these types of things, uh, is that the sample size is about 5,000 people across the G7. Uh, we've also added this year China and some other Asian countries, including Australia. So you get a slightly bigger picture. And we've added to it uh, the latest data that we could see on just the real evidence about inequity in areas like health, technology, and finance. Uh, and what we can see is that basically perceived inequalities, real inequalities, and persistent stereotypes, which Anne is going to talk about in a minute, are still strong. And I, I think the point about stereotypes is that they matter. They're things in our heads that are not necessarily true, but they have real-world consequences. So what does the evidence show? Uh, unfortunately, it's not really showing progress in terms of people's perceptions of what is happening. So most people, two-thirds, two out of three, say that uh, gender inequalities are, are widespread. Half of them say they're widespread in their own country. In Europe, that is 56%. And those numbers are actually rising. Now, is that reality? Or is that just perception? We're becoming more sensitive to these things. But either way, uh, it's certainly not necessarily great news. There are real issues that we need to talk about. The other thing that we can see is that most people, most men and most women, agree that women lose out uh, in competition for jobs and promotions to men, even if they're the same level of competence. So to be, a, to be a successful woman, as we often know, you often have to be better than a man. Over to you. So first thing is, you know, it's Anne Gabrielle. Anne Gabrielle. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. We'll get it right next year. <laughs> okay, so this is yeah. the uh, official announcement for the fifth edition to come. So if we look at this slide, you know, it's a fascinating one and extremely surprisingly, what you can see is that 44% of men still believe that men and women brains are different and that it influences their scientific abilities. You also notice that 41% think that men are naturally more ambitious than women, and 40% that women are more fragile than men. And if I may, not only men think this way, but also you can see many women share this very same perception. We are all convinced that uh, balancing work and private life is a big challenge and a burning issue for all, and uh, especially for women. So look at what women have to face. A share as high as 69% think that it is more difficult for a woman to have a successful career because she has to accept to sacrifice her family life. This one is my favorite, so to speak. 52%, I cannot even read, consider that you cannot have it all. 
not to mention the 31% who believe that a woman will always be happier in her personal life as a mother than in her professional life. So I don't know about you guys, but personally, I find it hard to believe. It is 2023 in some of the richest countries in the world, and guess what? It's heading in the wrong direction. So now the question, what's happening in the workplace? What we see is that women are less present than men in the labor market. They work more part-time than men, and they have a large gender gap to face. We can see that inequalities are well perceived. One woman out of three has already realized that they were less paid than men colleagues having equal competencies. And here is a slide that, in my opinion, the best sums up the burden women have to bear. Worldwide, women provide 76% of all unpaid care. And in the most rich country, in OECD country, they work on unpaid care four hours versus two hours for a man. If this trend continues, see at the bottom of the slide, the gender gap in unpaid care will be closed in 2228, <laughs> just 205 years from now. Probably we could be patient, but that's not what we recommend. More seriously, again, what is important is to know that unpaid care has an impact and forces women to interrupt their career, which has an impact, again, on their financial security. 47% stopped working for one or more months to take care of a relative. 41% for one or more year. And here, is a gender gap, you can see, 20 or 22, between men and women that have stopped to work for one or more years. What is the consequence? The risk for women is really, really high. In the EU, women over 65 face a gender gap of 37% in their pension, and across OECD, the average old, old age poverty rate is 15% for women versus 10% for men. Ben, Thank you. what comes next? And the challenge is, of course, that these uh, imbalances, these disadvantages extend not just uh, inside work and in people's careers, but of course also actually in, in health outcomes. So we can see that um, most people believe that actually spending more money and targeting women's health will be better in general for developing new treatments, uh, will be better um, for overall population life expectancy. And despite the fact that women do live longer than men, they tend to do so in poor health. And two out, th three out of four, 77% of, of people over the 65, women over 65, um, are, are long-term care patients. So there's a clear burden on women in terms of health. And I was, I was particularly interested in this one. Women's mental health uh, is nearly always worse than men's. I first noticed this, actually, before I started working on this series with Anne Gabrielle and her colleagues, uh, during the pandemic, when many of the countries in Europe were tracking the mental health impacts of the pandemic. And I noticed that women were doing much worse in the pandemic than men. And then I dug into it and found out that women always do worse, whether it's because they're under more pressure domestically, and at work, whether it's because of money, which is another thing that some of the researchers in well-being and happiness mentioned, um, it's a real phenomenon. And this is important because 2023 was the year globally where mental health overtook cancer as the number one health concern on this planet. Uh, in our Ipsos uh, tracking series. And so I think this is a real issue. We're in a world mental health crisis, and it particularly affects women. On technology, we're, of course, living through a golden age of generative AI. Uh, all things will be possible to us soon, so we're told. Uh, <laughs> but we should really think again about whether that technology is dealing with 
inequities in our society or is actually exaggerating and enhancing them. So on technology, first of all, we can see that men rather than women, young boys rather than young girls are the people who are interested in technology, ten times more likely to say that they want to go and work in this, in this industry. Uh, we can see that women have a minority role in science R&D, despite people like Marie Curie in the past. And when we look at the, the AI startups that are perhaps the next wave of technology, only one in five has any woman on their, in their C-suite. So some real biases. Are we just reproducing the bias of tech bros from California? Uh, and overall, at the current rate of change, which is a little bit better than on unpaid work, but it's still 2080, when I won't be alive, that women will be doing even half the ideas that are getting patented by major intellectual property offices. And then going on, uh, you know, if you look at what people are actually seeing, uh, men are about uh, much more likely to notice jobs in STEM, in science and technology, than women. And we can also see that in the advertising that we're placing for those jobs, we're using words like leader, being dominant, competitive, ambitious, we've already heard about. Uh, and interestingly, just those words, the language we use, makes a difference. We can see that when we change those words, when we use more neutral words, maybe AI could actually help with this. Yeah. Uh, you suddenly find that the rise of more women apply. There are natural words that turn people off applying. So if we can change those, we will get more female applicants. So oh. what does the future show? Aha. So on this one, I must admit, we have both good news and not so great news to share with you. So the first one is, what do the younger generation think? And uh, they do not seem to care much about the fight for gender equality. This is the sad news coming from this barometer and the one we should all have in mind. 47% of people under 35 are convinced that women's brains are different from men's brain. And guess what? 54% if we just ask men under 35. 43% of under 35 believe that women are psychologically more fragile than men, and 51% of men under 35 are of this opinion. And then 36% of other 35 think that the salary gap is not an important gender issue. So guys, I don't know who is less than 35 in the room and what you actually think, but I mean, there is something to do here. And for those who are older than 35, maybe we've done something wrong with our children. I don't know what, but we have an issue. It's, for me, both incredible and concerning. You know, like if the, the world that uh, young people are shaping uh, seems extremely uncertain for the battle for gender uh, equity. But, 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 good news, good news to come. First, 70% believe that closing the gender gap is a priority in their country. And, and, more good news, 75 people of men, I'm sure Ben is in this, this number, are you? I am. Yes, Absolutely. way, yes. good, yes. excellent, thank my, you. My pay is actually dependent on closing the gender gap at Ipsos. So that's true, yeah. that's yeah. true, that's true. Okay. So 75% of men are convinced that they have a role to play in uh, reducing inequalities. So where are we? One, bias and stereotypes are on the rise. The new generation appears indifferent to this crucial fight, but many consider that closing the gender gap should be a priority and they want to take action. And because the time of action is now, we have tested strong and feasible measures with respondents, and you will see a super, super high number is in favor, which is really, I think, cause for optimism. So if we take healthcare as an example, 84% are in favor of including in leaflets of medicines extremely precise information on the effect on women and on men. Or 89% of the respondents consider we should have an equal share of men and women in the clinical trial of drugs at each stage of the development of the drugs. 
we have broad support for most of the recommendations that we've submitted to uh, the respondents. So you can have a look in STEM, in finance, everybody seems to be extremely in favor of sometimes tough measures. Same in uh, financial measure and financial education, you find extremely high level of support. So now, now, as a conclusion, what we need to do is act on the cultural barriers that are still here today, on the stereotypes, on the bias. So if we recap, and guess what? He gave me the negative part, and he oh. kept the positive one. Seriously, seriously, we shared just five minutes ago, and that's what he did. <laughs> So the best, the, the worst part, okay, the worst part is for me to share again with you. 16% gender gap, 76% of unpaid work done by women, and a new generation that doesn't seem to be actively involved in the fight for gender equity. Well, so and the positives, there is no slide you there they remember. Are. Those, so those are some challenges. Okay, there are. Those are some <laughs> right. challenges. I think, but at the same time, Again, it is better to be female in 2023 than in 1973. We are making some progress. Yes, true. Um, I think the fact that we have so many people saying that more needs to be done means we shouldn't give up and we should keep going. Our expectations, I think expectations of both men and women are changing. I was uh, appalled recently when I found out that in one region of my company, the, the, the manager had appointed four men to new roles and not a single woman. Mm -hmm. He won't do that again. Good. Um, uh, I think most men now recognize that they have a role. I think this is, you know, this is work in progress. And generally, there is this support that we've already seen for making changes. Of course, it's when the rubber hits the road, when you're actually making those changes. When you're, if you're making women more socially mobile upwards, that means some men are not going to get to be chief executives. We've got to accept that and just get over it. But that's where we are in 2023, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And just to, just to conclude, which is a bit difficult after Ben, two things. One, exactly on building on what Ben just said, we've never seen maybe so many women in leadership position in every sector of the economy and society and in every country. But at the same time, we see also what I was talking about this morning, uh, move backwards on some elementary female women rights in some countries. So it's a very mixed picture yeah. that we see in the world today. So now, what we shared, Ben and I, with you, it's not just figures, it's not just facts, it's a call to action. Please do whatever you can so that next year we come with better figures, Ben and I, in front of you. Thank you. Thank you.